Hi, my name is Andrew Saltis. The title of the talk is going to be Real-Time Map Reduce, Exploring Clickstream Analytics with Kafka, Spark Streaming, and WebSockets. Kind of a mouthful. So first, just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, currently working at Insighten on an agile marketing platform as of three months ago. For the previous five, almost five years, worked at WebTrends on visitor analytics and streaming analytics platforms. So that's where I kind of first fell in love with Spark and then Spark Streaming. So some of the stuff we'll talk about relates to that experience and kind of just using Spark and Spark Streaming. So kind of where we're going is talk about Spark, briefly Spark Streaming, more particular, kind of how I fell in love with it. Give a brief overview of an architecture or picture I have in mind of the streaming platform. Give a bird's eye view of Kafka really quick in case people just haven't used it. Discuss Spark Streaming in more detail. And then kind of walk through some Clickstream examples and then kind of discuss getting data out of Spark Streaming. So how I fell for Spark, um, it's kind of like three worlds collided. Uh, on October 14th, when Felix Baumgartner jumped from the edge of space for Red Bull, Red Bull happened to be a WebTrends customer. It was the largest single hour of traffic collected for WebTrends in its 15-year history. It just so happens that it also crashed all the analytics machines trying to process that data. At the same time, around that same time, Matei announced that Spark was going to be standalone and no longer required Mesos. So, which was great for us because we had a Hadoop cluster, didn't want to deploy Mesos, and then all of a sudden we had a problem that our production engines were crashing. So, we had a pretty big data set and we had a new toy to play with. So, we got Spark installed locally, got a local data set of the Red Bull data, and started to play. And realized that, wow, you could express things so easily we could actually answer questions that were crashing production and analytics engines. So from there, it just kind of continued. And we started to pursue using Spark for various things, read the DStreams paper, and were interested in then using Spark Streaming when that came out, because we were already running a storm cluster and already did some streaming analytics and wanted to see what this new thing could be. So why Spark Streaming? You know, like I said, we already had Storm running in production at providing a streaming analytics solution for our customers, really kind of event-based. So it's, you know, clicks coming in, some light augmentation, some light analytics, and then data going out as fast as possible. So pretty much from click to dashboard as quick as we can. So we already had that, yeah, but we wanted to deliver an aggregate stream. So we could do things like a rolling top end of pages, or the top visitors on the site, or the top countries, or top browsers. We wanted exactly one semantics to be able to do that. Right? We didn't want to risk double counting or have any issues like that. And we were OK with things being at second scale latency. Right? We didn't need the storm speed of an event stream. We were OK if things are delayed. We want to see top pages, say, last 10 seconds, last minute. So things could be delayed. It was just an aggregate of what's happening for your business at that time. We also want to have state management for computations. So if things did go south, as they do, we wanted to be able to recover and not lose our state. And since we've been using Spark and started to kind of fall in love with that and really appreciate using that coming from a Hadoop MapReduce world, we wanted the ability to combine that historical data that we were doing aggregations on with stuff that was streaming. So then we could get a more holistic picture of a user, do some other analytics on the data, or do something with it. So in my mind, this is kind of a generic streaming data pipeline, if you will, that we have a browser, some device, click on something, ends up going to some tags, or if you will, some analytics vendor, or it could be anything else that collects that data, possibly drop it into some message queue of some sort, goes through some analysis tier, possibly in some sort of in-memory store, and then some data access tier where you could get the data back out. All right, so in the storm architecture I had talked about, you know, we pretty much had this type of thing with the analysis tier being Storm and the data access tier being you know, a web sockets, web service that we would then serve data through. So as we started to play with Spark Streaming, we thought, can we do a similar type of thing? So with that, this is pretty much the pipeline that I was thinking about, you know, putting together code for this and just kind of walking through it. Of, you know, I wasn't going to put together a, a real collection server, but I just got like the MSNBC, click traffic from the UCI KDD data set that has like 
you know, real visitor patterns for a day in, you know, in September. Basically took that, replayed it into Kafka, run it through Spark Streaming, back into Kafka and then out via a WebSocket server. Okay. It's so just a quick overview of, of Kafka, right? It's uh, initially developed at LinkedIn, distributed PubSub type messaging system. It's specifically designed for real-time activity streams. It doesn't follow any JMS standards or use the JMS APIs. It has APIs in most languages. Some key features of it is persistent messaging. It has high throughput, low overhead. Um, uses Zookeeper, whether that's good or bad. Um, it does. And supports both kind of queuing and topic semantics. And so it really kind of is designed to take this it kind of decouple this mess into something that looks more like this. So it sits in the middle. And the stuff we'll walk through is, you know, coming in through here, going to Kafka, and in this case, they go into real time or Spark Streaming. You know, these arrows could go both ways, you know, of having it come in this way and then feed back through and come back out. So Spark Streaming sits on top of Spark with the goal of delivering large-scale stream processing. It's pretty efficient and fault-tolerant, stateful stream processing. Uh, it integrates with Spark's batch interactive processing. So you're working with a stream of data, and it really feels no different than if you're working with a file that's coming out of Hadoop. So everything kind of feels the same, and you could kind of mix them. And you really kind of lose sight of where that is, and it blends it really well. It provides a simple batch-like API, so you can implement complex algorithms. So the same thing, you really don't know you're working with a stream. You just realize you're working with a different type of RDDs that, Storm, that Spark exposes. You know, with that, it provides a certain programming model. So in Spark, there's a notion of these RDDs, these resilient data sets. In Spark Streaming, there's DStreams, which is a discretized stream. These are very similar APIs. It looks and feels very similar to it. Um, you pretty much live in a world of you have input, where you have DStreams that are being created from an input stream or from another stream. All right? And then you deal with operations on them. where you are going to transform them and do something with them, and then you're going to output the result to somewhere. Out of the box, the data sources for input are HDFS, Kafka, Flume, Twitter, TCP sockets, Aka Actor, Zero MQ, and they're pretty easy to kind of roll your own as well. It's not that, not that hard. It's pretty well abstracted. So they got a lot of things pretty covered from an out of the box standpoint on getting data in. And as we'll see, getting data out is a little bit of a different story at this time. Yeah, so some of the operations, when they say transform, you know, really just allows you to build new streams from existing ones. So there's RDD-like operations. It's the same thing you've seen if you've looked at Spark before or at other similar platforms, where there's map, flat map, filter, count by value, reduce, group by key. You know, so a variety of things. Some of the ones in bold we'll see as we kind of walk through just some code examples of it. Some of the things that are new that it does bring to the table that don't exist in Spark are the windowing operations. All right, we could do a window, you could count by window, you could reduce by window, count by value and the window, reduce by key in the window, and you could update state, which is pretty interesting for doing certain things. So we saw that there were a lot of different input options. This is all you get for output out of the box. You get print, which will print to the driver's screen, so that doesn't really do a whole lot for you. You get for each RDD, where you could perform an arbitrary operation on every RDD that came out of the batch. So it kind of gives you the point that you could do something. And you could save as an object file. You save as a text file. You could save as a dupe files. So somewhat limited for a streaming platform to only have that as the output. Um, there's some different projects out there to have other outputs. Um, it's just it's always been the focus to get data in. And so far, not a whole lot that's gone on to getting data out. Yeah, so as we'll see, what, what I've put in place, at least what I have here, is, is just leveraging that for each to send data out. But it's still not as clean as 
the inputs that they offer, because the inputs all seem the same. It's a generic way of getting data in. There's no really good generic way to get data out. So the discretized stream processing we talked about, so really kind of how this looks in the picture that we had, is you imagine this stream of data coming through Kafka, and it's really kind of breaking it up into these batch sizes. All right, so you imagine each one of these, as the stream is flowing, each one of these representing a batch of data coming through, you know, it could have a granularity of, say, like a half a second. Right, so as it flows through, you end up inside of Spark Streaming, say we're consuming this from Kafka, we're going to do some processing on it, and then we're going to send out these process results, again, in some sort of batch increment. Right, so it's a stream that gets broken up, these little discretized pieces, you process them and send them out. Some of the clickstream examples I want to walk through. There's some common ones that you'll see, just like page views per batch. And that could really just be anything, right? I'm just counting the number of page views in one of those batches. Looking at page views by URL over time. So maybe you want to see things, like I said, if you want to see what are the top pages in the last 10 seconds or the last 30 seconds or whatever time frame you may want to do. The top end page views over time. So in that case, they just want like the top 10. They don't care about seeing all of them, but you just want the top 10 for a dashboard. So maybe you want to see the top 10 pages. Maybe you want to see the top 10 countries or browsers or cities. Another one is keeping a session up to date. You know, so say you have something where someone's on a site and there's traffic coming through and you have their session in hand and you want to be able to keep track of that session as more data flows through. So that's where we'll see where update state by key, we could hold on to a session that's live and keep updating that session as more traffic flows through. Joining the current session with historical. So in this case, say you have, again, that same session and someone's on a site or doing something, and then you also want to be able to reach back and grab whatever their history may be and pull that together. And maybe you want to run some other computation on that. Maybe you want to do some sort of prediction as to the likelihood someone may buy, the likelihood they may abandon, the likelihood that they may do something, provide a recommendation for them. There's a lot of different things you could do. You could also decide that maybe it's not historical, but in just this general joining of two streams, maybe you want to join the current visitor stream with the weather. So now you could grab their zip code, grab the weather in their zip code, and have an idea, if you're a pool company, of whether or not you should provide them an offer or make some other decision based upon this other data. So it could really be used to join any two streams. It could also be used to join a stream with existing Spark RDD as well. So it could be coming out of Hadoop or two streams coming in from, say, Kafka or Kafka and Twitter. So the first thing to get things going to be able to do kind of our page views that are just in each batch, you got to create a stream from Kafka. So this is in their Java API, which is painful at times. Um, it shows you more, I think, of what's going on than some of what gets hidden from Scala, but this kind of working with this starts to feel like the old argument of C++ or VB. You know, where you start to write a whole bunch here, and the Scala API is a lot more succinct. But really where it all starts is you have this Kafka utilities create stream. Once you do that, and that's going to take some configuration, that's going to be typically what you would provide to have a Kafka consumer that's going to consume data. So this is what I'm saying, that the input sources are really clean. This is all you have to do. And you could have them for all different types of sources, you know, from a file or from anything. It's really clean like that. So it makes it nice. So what this is going to return to us is this messages dstream. Right? This is going to have in it you know, two pieces, that's going to be the tuple that's coming out of Kafka, and our data is going to be in here. So what we're going to do with that is turn around, and in this case, I had stuffed the data in that it was tab delimited with a visitor ID and the URL that they were on. So what we're going to do is just map that to a new RDD that's going to be composed of this tuple of visitor ID and URL. Okay, so all this does when it goes through is just basically split the data and assign it. Okay, so what it looks like down here is pretty much what's happening in this code is you have this consumer, you have some batch happening at time t, at time t plus one, t plus two, so time's going on this way. We create this stream and at each batch, we're going through, we have this message d stream that we created. 
which are here, right? We're going to perform that map operation, which is here, and we're going to end up with this events D stream. Right. At this point, it's all just there. Nothing's really going on. Right? It's just we have this data in hand, or will once we go to act upon it. Okay. So now we have that. We have our stream set up from Kafka, and we have just all the raw events coming in from Kafka. Now we can start to actually do something with it. So the first would be, okay, let's do the page views per batch, see how much is coming in. So again, we take that events stream that we had before, and now we're going to perform a map operation on it. All right, and we're going to take visitor ID and the URL they're on, and we're going to return back the URL from here, and then we're just going to do a count by value. Okay, so what's going to end up happening is we're going to get a count of the URLs with their account of all the URLs and their values. Okay, so the same thing that applies is data is moving across this way, you know, t equals one, t plus one, t plus two, as a map operation happens, and then we turn around and do a count by value, we end up with this page counts d stream. Okay, so at this point we have the count, that's the URL, and the number of times it appeared in that batch. If we want to take that a little further and say, well, now we have that, that really doesn't give you a whole lot except knowing how many URLs were in a batch. So you could maybe see like a number of events that are coming in, but you're really not doing a whole lot with it. So now if you actually want to say you want to see the page views per URL over time, now we can take again that same events D stream that we had. We're going to perform a different map operation on it. Do the same thing of returning back the URL. This time we're going to do a count by value and window. So the same before we did a count by value, this time we're going to count the values as well, which are the URLs, and, the, and a window in time. Okay, so this is going to be our window length that we want to do it over a 30 second window. And we want our batch interval to be at five seconds. Okay, so we'll have 30 seconds of data and compute this computation every five seconds. When that's done, we'll go ahead and reduce it by key. Okay, and then what we end up here, right, is so coming out of this every five seconds, it's a mini map reduce job, if you will, runs, batch job that runs, that we end up with the URLs and their counts. And then we're going to turn around and reduce it by the key, which is the URLs. We get the values which are coming in as the counts, and we just add them together and just return it. Okay, so what ends up happening when this comes out, and we go to use this, is we end up having the sum of counts for URL every five seconds. So from here, you can just see all the URLs happening. Every five seconds, you have access to all the URLs with their counts of how many times they were visited. The one thing that's different between, oh, wrong way, between say these page views per batch or, and this, this doesn't do any sort of windowing operation at all. So there's nothing that needs to get persisted anywhere for failover, right? So you notice when we do this, and now we want to count by value in a window, and we're going to need to have a window of 30 seconds and a batch interval of every five seconds, that data needs to be stored somewhere, okay? So there's a checkpointing that you need to basically set up in Spark Streaming to tell it where to checkpoint. And it'll checkpoint to HDFS by default. If you run it locally, just give it a local directory and it'll checkpoint to there. By default, with count by value and window, it'll checkpoint every 10 seconds. And that, again, is, that's controllable. So now we've got all the page views with their counts going on. Something that's maybe more interesting or more useful instead of just streaming a bunch of data at someone is actually just have the top. And maybe you want the bottom. In this case, we're just going to do like the top. So in this, we're going to take that sliding page counts that we just had before. We're going to turn around and basically just swap them. So now instead of having the URL and its count, we're going to end up with a, mat, with a D stream that has the count and the URL. Once we have them swapped, we're going to turn around, transform that, 
and basically sort by key. And then I come, I mistakenly deleted code that should have been there. Now, the last thing that you would do is from there, you could do a take and take 10, and you'll get back just the top 10. And since it's already in sorted order, it's just going to give you back the first 10 from there. There's also an API to make this simpler that you could just do a top. You could do, it's other ways that you could solve the same problem. So say in this case, that's all great, and you have a dashboard that has the top end of things that are going on. Maybe it's pages, maybe it's cities, whatever you want it to be, some other data. And now you want to basically have the situation of you want to update a current session as something's flowing by. Say it's a user session as they're active. All right, so what you could do with update state by key is really specify a generic function to modify previous state with new data. So in this case, we're going to declare this update function. That really all it's going to do is it's going to take this page view, assume that we have some page view object, and it's going to take the session. And then we're going to perform an operation on it, update in the session, and return that updated data. So now we could take in the new pages that were viewed, and the session object that we have that's representing our state, and update that session with a new page information, and then return it. Okay, so when we do that, this is the update function that will be passed in, and we just basically take, say, this page view dstream that we may have, call update state by key, and pass in the state information, the function that represents that. Okay, when that returns, then we have a visitor history and a current visitor session that's currently being kept as data is flowing through. You know, there's still things to work out that you would need to do as far as what happens when you know that state's no longer valid. You know, in the case of, say, a visitor session, it times out. So you still need to do other things outside of this to make sure that that's cleaned up or taken care of. So now you have a current session. Maybe we want to be able to join it with history so we can start to see what's this user done over the last 28 days compared to what they're doing today. And maybe you want to make predictions for them. Maybe you want to recommend something. Maybe you just want to update some information, not show them anything. So let's assume that we created this current sessions D stream and we created a historical sessions stream. This shouldn't say D stream. And that's just an RDD from Spark. And say our current sessions looks like this. We have, you know, it's composed of tuples of visitor ID and some JSON object that says that's current session, another visitor ID with a current session. And then we have historical sessions that look something, you know, not too different from it. Visitor ID 1 with a historical session. Visitor ID 2 with a historical session. So now we go ahead and we just call current sessions.join and pass in the historical sections. What it's going to end up doing is joining on the keys. So as long as these keys match, or they do here, you're going to end up coming back with a tuple in a, that has a list in it of the sessions. So you're going to end up with the visitor's ID along with a tuple of all the sessions from the joining of those two streams. So in this case, it works if you want to do stuff with visitors. It said this could be from a Spark RDD that you created. It could be from another stream coming in from, say, Twitter, and you have someone's ID and you want to combine things. It could be weather data. It could be anything you want where you have an RDD or a DStream in hand and the key is common and you want to combine them. So, so where are we? So we kind of walk through kind of this flowing through. We kind of got these chunks of data coming out, right, in these batches of a half a second. We did some processing on it, and then we have the process results going out, and then back into Kafka. So in this case, I chose to use Kafka. There's other ways that you could do it as well. You know, so you see that there's some problems that you need to consider if you end up using Kafka and say you have a WebSocket that's connecting and you have some WebSocket server that's going to be managing clients, there's things that you need to consider within Spark streaming that are unlike Spark. Right? So for instance, 
a regular Spark job, when you run it, it's like a MapReduce job. The computation is done, the job's done. In a Spark streaming job, it runs forever until you kill it. So it doesn't end as soon as the computation's done. So the batches that you run it in, it's just sitting there in a loop, if you will, and constantly running. So you imagine if we did have, say, this going on, and we had those you know, handful of streams that we were going over of, say, top end, and we're updating visitor history, and we're doing these things, those are always going to be running and producing data to somewhere. So there are some things you need to consider you know, when you have it set up where they're launched and run and they're just going to be pushing data out of there's no way to kind of shut things down and to clean it up. So getting data out of Spark streaming. So as I saw before that it only supports, you know, print for each RDD, you know, save objects to files, save to HDFS, save to text. Doesn't, and doesn't do anything more than that. So kind of the next step is once we have this here of how do you get it to Kafka. So this is one example of how you could use a for each RDD, um, which again is, is not a generic way of output, but it's the only way currently to be able to have access to the collection of RDDs from a batch and to do something with them. This Kafka producer can show you is really nothing more than just typical standard Kafka producer code. And just go through, and in this case, you know, we had, say, the top end stream that we were doing, and we were going to attach this operation to these sorted counts that we had from before. And we're going to loop over these RDDs, build up this map, and then basically turn around and send the top 10 list. So, and this is where I said before that, you know, you could do this if this RDD take. So we had that sorted counts. You could just execute this take to be able to take the top 10 elements from that sorted RDD. So this is nothing different here except just walking through it and then just call it a Kafka to produce and just to send it. All right, so not as generic as getting data in. So WebSockets kind of chose of had success with it. It's kind of an abuse of it at times. If you use it for Storm at very high volume to have all that data going out to WebSockets, um, you know, it really causes pain sometimes to browsers when you're pushing a fast stream across it. Yeah, but it looks fun. It shows well. It does pretty cool things. So it's a standard way to get data in and out, easy to prototype with a browser. So one way of handling it Oh, wow. Sorry. Wrong button. You know, so one way of handling this WebSocket server when someone connects is basically just starting to consume data from Kafka. And starting to consume on, say, a top 10 or top end topic and start pulling that data back and sending it to a browser. And so I said where this could end up with problems is you run into issues potentially with multi-tenancy of how do you know how many clients you're going to have and you have different data that's being processed through here and then you've got to have different data that's through here and you have resources being consumed in Spark Streaming, say for its multiple customers, of how do you have all those jobs running at one time and how do you make sure you have enough resources and what do you do if you're running computations for, say, a customer's data, but there's no one over here even listening for it or wanting it? Right, so then you're sitting there just computing stuff and not going. And it's not going nowhere. So another option, as opposed to doing this, that I've seen be successful, is have that WebSocket server have a client that comes in, and since you're already infested with ZooKeeper, if you have Kafka, of turning around and registering this server in ZooKeeper with some sort of ID about the browser that's connected to it or the WebSocket client that's connected to it. And then having Spark Streaming and the code you have in there, watching ZooKeeper for changes and seeing who has the data and who needs the data. And then via ZRMQ, 
going from Spark streaming back to WebSocket server. So then you could handle things of starting up a stream if someone connects. You could tear down a stream when someone disconnects. And you could handle state in here as far as resource consumption. So this works well as this kind of demo, but it is it does have some potential issues based on what you're going to do here, because those jobs never stop running. It's kind of just a summary, and then we could walk through the code and show the demo running if we want. Um, you know, Spark streaming works well for clickstream analytics. You know, we use it for doing those types of things. We use it for trying to do some sort of predictions and just kind of working with that data. It was still, there's no good out of the box output operations for a stream. You know, for each is it's just not that great. Um, multi tenancy it needs to be thought through. You know, so there's because those jobs have no end of life. You're stuck in the position of having to control what happens to them. How do you bring them up? How do you bring them down? With regular Spark, if you notice, there's now a job server that you could submit jobs to. I've done things where it compiles MapReduce you know, Spark jobs on the fly and launches them. You know, that's nice and that's easy because as soon as that job finishes, you get back the results, it's gone. In this case, even if you do the same thing and you programmatically launch a Spark streaming job, you have to know when it needs to die or it can continue to just kill resources. That's all that I had. Right now, I don't know if I. It's time for Q and A then. Sure. Uh, okay, just give me a sec. So, if I understand, you were using Zookeeper as a control channel in order to control what parts of the streaming jobs were running or not. Yeah. Uh, yes, you could use Zookeeper to, as a control. So. Uh, have you considered using Kafka as a control channel? I've heard people do that and publish requests on Kafka and, and then the Spark in this case would respond with a, a um, new stream. I haven't, uh, actually I have not looked at doing it. I'll show you where we did use it. Um, we had used Zookeeper, you know, in place of Kafka here, so just kind of take this out of the picture. So if you imagine this arrow going to here over a 0MQ, we do Zookeeper here, and we do things where if, like, say, a client connected via the socket server, we'd have the client idea of who it is, we know what their rights are and what they're allowed to, and then register in Zookeeper the IP address of this host along with the client that's connected, and then from there, inside of, inside of the streaming, basically listen for changes in Zookeeper and know that this host services this client and then send the data through. Yeah, uh, that's the scenario I'm referring to. I've heard people use Kafka for precisely that. Hmm. So in, in your Spark streaming code, yeah. you could have a, a, like a Kafka consumer listening right. to essentially requests over Kafka, and then you wouldn't have to connect Spark and Zookeeper. Right, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I can see that working. Yeah, and then we just handle like a disconnect, which could be another message in, in the Kafka topic. Certainly. Yeah, that's a good idea. We started prototyping something uh, similar with uh, Spark Streaming, but uh, instead of Kafka, we uh, are using uh, Flume. Um, all the, all, what happens when uh, messages are dropped, or if uh, what is the redundancy on the Kafka side? I, I'm not too much uh, familiar with Kafka. Um, are there um, duplicated uh, elements or dropped elements? So it could store the data based on time. We had it set up where it would store data for 72 hours. So it would hold on to messages for 72 hours before anything would get deleted. I'm sorry, I didn't repeat your question. I think you, uh, you had asked. No, 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 uh, I was saying um, the flow of events from um, um, at, at the input of Spark Streaming. Uh, so you say that Kafka is reliable, right? Mm hmm Oh, for input, so yeah. you're asking about input into Spark Streaming? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, Kafka is one of the input sources. Yeah, and uh, compared to Flume, that uh, uh, in case of a problem, you can have duplicated messages. Uh, does that happen with Kafka? 
You could. I mean, it doesn't know, right? So you could have multiple producers producing the same data onto Kafka. Yeah, that's not my question, but whatever. Sorry. Okay. You were explaining how you, you were merging or joining data with his, uh, on, um, streaming data with the historical data, right? Correct. And you have pretty short batches, right? And you can have quite a bit of historical data. So how does this join happen actually efficiently? Because uh, I thought it should happen more or less immediately, but you can have lots of historical data. So I didn't quite get it. Right, so then the question was, how do you combine the historical data with the in-flight data fast? Is that right? So the historical data that we had was just visitors and partition by visitor. So we would have data that's routed to the right nodes with a visitor and then have all the data that's there. And in reality, a lot of visitors don't have that much data. So it ends up not being that big. In aggregate, it's a lot, there's a lot of data across all the visitors. But as someone streaming flew, through, it's really not often do they have a lot of data. If you look at a lot of web analytics, everyone believes that people come back all the time, but the reality is a lot of people don't, and sessions are small, so the history really sometimes isn't that big. But can it, can it pile up, actually, still, if you're unlucky and... Certainly, so, and you're, you're stuck there, right, because if you're getting this data from HDFS, then that becomes a bottleneck of getting it into Spark. And then at that point, right, you're bound by memory or, or putting it to disk. addition to this question, if you have, for example, uh, 3 billion user IDs and have only 10, 10 million coming in in parallel, so how can be this really efficient to figure out, um, uh, do continuously filtering through this, even if it's partitioned by server? Right. So, so you have to go to a huge amount of data every time because the data is stored in, probably in something more uh, SQL right. internal in terms uh, a partition. Right, so I think the question was, so if you, the data just kept exploding, how do you do it efficiently? So we had used a bloom filter to keep track of whether or not the visitor is possibly on that node, and to keep track to do checks to see if they're there before doing the operations. So we would build those and then have that there in hand to see whether or not we actually had to try and do some massive join. Um, what was the problem with the uh, Mesos? So why did you have to wait for the standalone feature in Spark? Uh, so the question was, why was there a problem with Mesos and we had to wait? Uh, there's no problem. We we're just a small shop, at least, and we had a Hadoop cluster that was just plain vanilla Apache, and we, weren't, we just weren't in a position to be able to also deploy a cluster that had Mesos. So once it was standalone and that was one less thing we needed to go asking for, it just became much easier for us. So there was no problem with it. We didn't have issues with it technically. It was more of an operational thing of can we go ask for yet one more cluster. So that was all. If I remember correctly, you used to have a storm cluster. Is that correct? Uh, before uh, you tried out Spark? No, so the question was we used to have a storm cluster. Actually, still do. It was kind of side by side. So we're using storm for an event stream. And then we want to explore using Spark streaming for doing more of like an aggregate stream and things that didn't need that from click to dashboard as short as possible. Okay. So uh, it was something that continues to run and is out there. One of the nifty features of Storm is, is the, um, that you can push stuff to backing store and have a cache in front of it if you use Trident, that is. Is that something that you use? Have you missed it in Spark? Or how did you solve it in that case? Um, so the state you get from Trident, we you know, had looked at it, didn't play much with it, but you get pretty efficient you know, execution of it with Spark Streaming. So it's going to store that data. You could push data to HDFS from Spark Streaming as well. So it doesn't always have to go out. You could save data off every time a batch runs. A question on join, joining two these streams. Uh, I see the problem that when you join two these streams, the problem is that you have to have the same keys at the same batch, right? 
do you, do you see it really a problem for you or do you do you solve it somehow right so the question was joining two d streams you have to have the same key in the same batch and the only thing that we were attempting to do is just make sure that visitors were routed the same way and just that we'd end up with the same visitor IDs on the same Spark notes. So, and I think it could be a problem though if you don't have the key there, you kind of, you're not going to join. Right? So we handled it by trying to route visitor IDs. I believe we still have time for one last question. If no, thank you very much. Thank you.